Hello, my friends. <laughs> Everybody say, hello, Facebook. <laughs> These people love you. They love you. Hey, if you live local, just come next week, 630. Anyway, so tonight, the pathology of false discipleship. I want to let you know up front, this evening's lesson will be heavily evangelistic. So if there's anyone in here or listening, watching online, listen, there's going to come a time in this talk, this sermon, when I'm going to ask you to, to do business with the Lord. If you've never met this Jesus, I'm going to ask you to come to grips with who he is. I'm going to ask you to make a decision. We're going to look at John chapter 6. And by the way, DL, I'm sure he's out tonight because he's just being careful uh, with the, the virus. Um, but he will be out on October 11th. And so I'll be preaching that day. And folks, I may preach this message. Um, and so for those of you here tonight, don't stay home because whenever I, even when I preach on Sundays, the late sermon's always a little bit different from the early sermon. And so there will be nuances shared that morning. Should I do this? But it has just affected me deeply, and I believe our people at large need to hear it. Let's review real quickly. You remember last week, <clears throat> Jesus miraculously fed the 5,000, well, really between 20 and 25,000 people. And then in verses 16 through 24 of chapter 6, he walked on the water. Um, according to Mark's account of the same story, we know that Simon Peeper, <laughs> Peeper, Michelle, Simon Peter also walked on the water and then somehow they miraculously and immediately arrived at the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And then in verses 25 through 29, Jesus preaches his bloodiest sermon about being the bread of life and telling the people, it's now a time when you should appropriate what I've told you to accept by faith that I am who I say I am. You who have been hungry or thirsting for uh, earthly water and physical food, this will allow you sustenance for a while, but you will still die. However, in me, you will have life and life everlasting. I am the living water. I am the bread of life. I am. He made himself equal with God as he had in the previous chapters. And then he put it in graphic language, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. In other words, you must believe. All he's saying is, look, believe I am who I say I am and have faith in the bodily sacrifice that's about to take place. He is pointing to the cross. They can't possibly wrap their minds around that. You remember they tried to crown him king by force after he miraculously fed the twenty to 25,000. But of course, he didn't come to be king on our terms. It's the same thing Satan tried to get him to do in the wilderness. I reminded you of that last week. Jesus, do tricks for us. Bypass the crown of thorns. Go straight to the crown of gold. Well, Jesus said his objective, his goal, Luke records, was to seek and to save that which was lost. This is done solely by offering himself as the sole sacrifice acceptable to God on our behalf. Does that make sense? Folks, that is the gospel. So at the end of this, Jesus offered an invitation of sorts. At the conclusion of his message of being the bread of life, what follows, what we're about to read, the concluding verses of chapter 6, is how that invitation was received. It did not go well. So let's read the passage together. I have it listed for you there on your notes. And then we'll go back and we'll unpack, we'll exposit, we'll exegete to use some preaching terms, the principles and implications. So here we go. Verse, starting with verse 60 of John chapter 6. So on hearing this sermon, this graphic sermon on the bread of life, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, Jesus, aware that his disciples were grumbling, this reminds us of his omniscience, he said to them, does this offend you? 
Well, he already knows the answer, but he wants them to answer. He says, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Your earthly bread will satisfy you for a moment, but I will satisfy you for eternity. The words I have spoken to you, the words, we'll come back to that. They are full of spirit and life. Say the word life. life. Yep. The, yet there are some of you who do not believe. Say the word believe. believe. Yep. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him, his omniscience. He went on to say in verse 65, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. And then verse 66, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You know, Spurgeon said, let me just interject this, he said, you and your sins must separate or you and your God will never come together. These people had no interest in separating from their own desire to run their own life. So we continue in verse 67. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. So let's unpack a few of these verses. So we see here in verse 60, on hearing this sermon, this message, many of the disciples said this is a hard, scleros is the Greek word for hard. Who can accept it? This word hard teaching, that word scleros, guess what, we, guess what English word we get from that? Sclerosis, right. It's a, a hardening, a stiffening. It's, it's harsh and rough. Listen, they didn't like it at all. Now you go home and find some 60 grit sandpaper and just start rubbing your arm with it real hard. You're not going to want that to happen very much or very long, right? And this is the way it was affecting those who were already not going for this. The Amplified Translation of the Bible, which I love puts it this way. When many of his disciples heard this, they said this is a difficult and harsh and offensive statement. So this word for hard is the same word Jesus uses story in the story of the talents. Remember, D.L. just preached on that last week. Look what Jesus said. This, this servant who was the unfaithful servant. Then the man, the unfaithful servant, who had received one talent, came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard, scleros man. Now look what he says, because this gives us insight <clears throat> into the meaning of the word. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, excuse me. I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So the use of the word here gives really alarming context to the response of the people when they said this is hard teaching, because... Obviously, the master in this story represents God. The man, the unfaithful servant, represents mankind. But he, look what he does. He accuses his master of being dishonest. Master, I knew you were hard. I mean, above the rules. You harvest where you haven't even sown. You gather where you're not scattered seed. You're just, you do it your way. I mean, this is what they're saying <clears throat> to Jesus. And so they say, who can accept it? Who on earth can accept this kind of teaching? Again, from the Amplified Translation, who can be expected to listen to this? In other words, it's very self-righteous as well. So you have people out there saying, listen, I, this is, I can't handle this. And I can assure you, no one else can either. It's a giant mess. 
But really what they're saying, I'm choosing not to accept it. That's what they're saying. They want to be patted on the head and told by Jesus, hey, I love you, do what you want. Do whatever makes you happy. So this story in John is also an indictment on people who take a casual and skewed look at Jesus and say he was a great teacher. He's not God, but he was a great teacher, a good man. In fact, that same phrase is used next week in chapter 7. A great model of morality, I like him. But clearly, <clears throat> they've ignored his hard teachings, like the words he gave to Nicodemus in chapter 3, the outcast woman in chapter 4, the religious leaders in chapter 5, and now this crowd in the synagogue here in chapter 6. Luke records Jesus describing true disciples and the cost of following him. Read along with me. And Jesus said to them, Look, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, look at this, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. That's a terrifying passage for those who have never professed their faith in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I have his book here, you can tell it's just about worn out. I've read it so many times. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. Bonhoeffer um, was a German theologian, a pastor, and while the majority of German pastors buckled underneath the weight of Hitler's um, rules and regulations, his systematic and subtle uh, strategy to exterminate the Jewish race. There were some pastors who saw right through it. You know, narcissists, man, it's hard to see a narcissist at first, right? They're charming. They... <clears throat> Man, they're slick. I like a, um, a phrase from a movie I saw one time. <clears throat> they're so oily, you can fry chicken on them. But Bonhoeffer and others like him, they said, we're not having it. And as a result, Bonhoeffer paid the ultimate price, the cost of discipleship. For in April of 1945, he went to the gallows and was executed for his faith. But in this book, The Cause of Discipleship, he talks about <clears throat> this cheap grace that characterizes this pathology of false discipleship. Look what he says. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. The church, the, the greater the family of God, the ecclesia, the family of believers that Feel the planet. He said, the grace we suppose is that the account has been paid in advance, and because it's been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Pat us on the head, go live your life like you want to. He continues and concludes, cheap grace means the justification, just if I never sinned, Christ's righteousness imputed to us, our sinfulness imputed to him on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Cheap grace means the justification of the sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Communion without confession. It is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Now my folks, that will preach. You see now why this has affected me so much. I, Listen, it was A.W. Tozer who said there is coming a day when we're not going to be able to take our Christianity near as casually as we do now. False disciples want cheap grace. They don't want to be told what to do, even if it will give them what they truly need, truth, life, hope, 
and peace. They want the A on the test without having to study. They want a starting position on the team without putting in the hard work. Their pride has blinded them. They want a nice Jesus. They wanted a Jesus who would put them... Um, that would pat them on the head and send them out to play to live their best life now. But Jesus, in the previous verses, previous verses, told the crowd in graphic language, you want real life, real joy, real food? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. In other words, believe in me, accept my bodily sacrifice, and receive life now and for all eternity. I have a warning for those who have tried Jesus and decided that he was not worth the effort. For those who reject belief in Christ, you must know there is no other sacrifice for sin. No other advocate. No other hope. You're on your own. And you are wagering eternity that you're right. And I sure wouldn't make that bet. On the day of judgment, your human effort for good will not tip the scale in your favor. We are, by our own nature, deeply flawed with sin. No one had to teach us to lie, to hate, to be impatient, to gossip. Nope, it all came naturally. It is our natural desire to sin. It's what the Bible calls the flesh or our sin nature. Hear me when I say that. Without saving faith in the risen Christ, you are lost and without hope, according to God. There is no other sacrifice for sins. Years later, John would write this same John the Disciple. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, which we all do, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Look what he says. <clears throat> we have an advocate, a defense attorney who pleads our case before the Father. Somebody ought to say amen. Folks, without him we're lost. God so loved the world that he gave. Oh, thank God Almighty. Do you sometimes, during your quiet times or when your mind is just maybe perhaps not occupied with other things, are you overcome with gratitude that God saved you? I am an advocate. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. My friends, if you have rejected faith in Jesus Christ, don't ever forget what I'm about to tell you. As I quote to you, the author of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't want that to happen. Because there is no second chance at that point. So we move along. Again, Jesus omniscience, aware that the disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this cause you to stumble, scandalizo? What English word do you think we get from that? There you go, scandal. Does this cause you to stumble and take offense? Let's unpack that a little bit. Grumbling, stumbling. This is an interesting progression. It's like the walking, standing, sitting of the man in Psalm chapter 1. Grumbling. Anytime Jesus uses the word grumble in the Gospels, it is within the context of criticizing and maligning. So grumbling at the very words of Jesus himself is a serious sin. And it's a stumbling block not placed in our path by Christ, but by our willingness not to believe in him. This not on him. Listen, he's done his part. And sin leads to sin because that leads to stumbling, to take offense. The Greek word, yes, is 
our English word scandal. It means to be offended, to, to see in a person what I disapprove of and what hinders me from acknowledging his authority. In other words, his words to them, his hard words, caused them to lose all respect for him. Now, understand, they didn't respect him to begin with. They respected his tricks. The miracles, that's what they wanted. They want the miracles, not the truth. They had no interest in that. They just want to be patted on the head, sent outside, go play, be happy, live your best life now. So what defines a scandal? It's a circumstance or action that offends or disgraces those associated with it. In their eyes, Jesus was now a disgrace. Remember in our last week's study, they said, is this not Joseph's kid who lives down the block in Nazareth? Good grief is a disgrace to his entire family. Next week, folks, in chapter 7, we were reminded that even Jesus' own family did not believe in him. So Jesus, knowing their thoughts, is asking them, do you find this offensive? Do you find yourself so outraged that you're through listening to me? Look what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, right? For Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks ask for wisdom. But we preach about a crucified Christ, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. They've gone from grumbling, maligning Jesus, to stumbling, becoming indignant that he has made himself equal with God. This has progressed from Jesus claiming to be the bread of life to forcing them to make a decision as to believe his words or not. Their response, how dare you? You go ahead and believe that you're God, but don't you dare sit there and say that we have to believe in you too. Oh, they're offended. You're a disgrace. This is hard teaching. It's abrasive. They're saying, Jesus, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> now it's personal. But the gospel is always personal. This is why I often say at the end of sermons, at times of decision, not always, but many times, listen, we're going to have a time of decision, and I want to remind you that if you don't decide, that is your decision. You've decided not to decide. Ignoring Jesus is a decision. The gospel itself is offensive, my folks, my friends. It's offensive because it tells us in no uncertain terms that we're deceitfully wicked, beyond natural cure and are in desperate need of a Savior. My friends, in those times when you perhaps have the opportunity to share the gospel, and never hesitate just to share your own story. You say, Nick, I don't have a dramatic story. I wasn't a drug addict. I've never been a drinker you know, much. I, I, I don't have a dramatic story. It doesn't have to be dramatic to be powerful. As long as Jesus is the point of the story, it's as powerful as any other one's story. But for those who would scoff at you, potentially even kind of maybe say something condescending, it's okay. Paul told us it's a stumbling block to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. So just know the same thing happened to Jesus, the same thing happened to Paul. And don't become discouraged. So we get to verse 66, which I, my Bible is so written up and annotated and drawn on and underlined and highlighted. It's, this verse, oh, I think I had it circled as well. From this time, Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Like I mentioned last week, boy, this wasn't a Billy Graham crusade. I tell preachers sometimes, look, they say, man, we had anybody saved in a long time. I say, are you doing your best? Are you preparing responsibly? Are you praying? Yes. Well, don't worry about it. Jesus had some sermons like that. In fact, not only did no one respond, they walked out. Grumbling leads to stumbling. 
leads to defection. The word disciple here, so you're not confused, is simply the Greek word for student or learner. This is why the 12 disciples are commonly referred to as the 12. He had many disciples. Oh, they were everywhere. People thought, would you not? You'd want to check this guy out, man. I mean, he's raising the dead and healing the lame and the blind and the deaf. I mean, I, I'd like to follow this guy and see what he's about. So many people were following him, hundreds if not thousands, trying to just get in on what he had going. And so it was many of those types of disciples that turned back. Now, there is, in the Greek, there is finality in this phrase. They turned back and no longer followed him. In other words, they didn't say, I've had enough, and then think about it and go, you know what, I'd like to have another conversation. These people never came back. Today they're in hell. Our daughter Macy, bless her heart, both of our daughters are performers. Uh, I, most of you know that. That is a challenging career choice. Uh, while other friends of ours, their children, were in college majoring in finance and law and education, um, what's your kids majoring in? Uh, music theater and music. What are they going to do? Well, when they graduate, they'll live at home. <laughs> but I will tell you, well, they sure have it. God has blessed those girls and given them great favor. That said, Macy performs at Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri. If you've never been there, I highly recommend it. The Ozarks are beautiful. In fact, at this time of year, the leaves are starting to turn. Um, but she called us one night this summer. Silver Dollar City, of course, is a giant amusement park set in the late 1800s up in the Ozark Mountains. And in the evening, when it closes, they have a giant amphitheater that seats, what, four or 5,000? 5, 5,000 people. <clears throat> it's outdoor, it's beautiful. And there are about, I think there are six performers. They form a group, Macy's the only girl. So she's well protected with all these men. And it's a terrific show, it really is, man. They... But she said, Dad, tonight, I mean, she was, she was upset, she was rattled, and she doesn't get rattled easily. She said, Dad, for whatever reason, when we started singing, people just started leaving. She said, I, she has this big song, Whitney Houston's remake of I Will Always Love You, right? I will always love you. And, I mean, it's, it's a great part of the show. She does an outstanding job. She said, Dad, I was singing that. Some people on about the fourth row just looked at me. One guy started holding his ears. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then he looked at his family. They all just stood up and walked out. And I said, man, I'm so sorry. Even the rest of the, 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 the performers, who some have been there 20 years, said that's the worst crowd we've ever had. And so I think about that as I read this. Because it's demoralizing. We know that Jesus was God, very God. But for a moment, I want to see him as man, very man. And as a human being, this hurts. I mean, it's one thing. If I stood up here and, um, and you showed no emotion whatsoever, you know, I could think, well, that was a, I really dropped the ball tonight. That was a horrible, horrible lesson. But it'd be another thing if I'm teaching and just one by one, you start leaving. <laughs> And after about 15 minutes, it's just me and Michelle, if she hasn't left already as well. <laughs> I remember a boy named Bill when I was at Southcrest as a youth pastor, and Bill was extremely intelligent. Michelle, you remember Bill. Extre he was a genius. And I started hearing through a few of his friends, they said, Nick, Bill doesn't believe in God anymore. I said, what? What are you talking about? Bill's always here. Sunday school, Wednesday nights, it goes to events with us. So I tracked Bill down and I said, Bill, man, what's going on? I said, do you still believe in God? He said, I don't. 
I said, why? He said, it just doesn't make sense. Well, I wish I had a happy ending that I was able to convince him otherwise, but he left there not believing. And it, I get emotional now because I love that boy. And I don't have love for hum mankind anywhere near the love Jesus had for those people who said, I've had enough. I'm not going there. This must have been, must have been heart wrenching for Jesus. So are there any other examples of this type of false discipleship in Scripture? I'd like for you to meet Demas. In Colossians 4, Jesus, this is how we know uh, Luke was a doctor, is from this verse. To the Colossians, he said, Our dear friend Luke, the physician, and Demas greet you. To Philemon, Paul wrote from prison. To Philemon, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-laborers, greet you too. But then something happened. I don't know. Maybe it was like my teenage friend Bill. Things might not have made sense. Maybe he got hurt by the church. I don't know. But Paul wrote to Timothy during his second imprisonment. He said, come to me quickly, Timothy, for Demas deserted me since he loved this present age. I do want to include this note. This is not about being unsaved. You can't be unsaved. If one truly leaves the faith, they never had the faith to begin with. Now, anybody can look like a Christian, especially as flawed as we are, right? But you can't be unborn again. I could call my mom all kinds of names, thumb my nose at her, be incredibly hateful, but can I ever not be her son? This is the precise reason Jesus used the phrase born again with Nicodemus. Salvation can, neither, can be neither earned nor unearned. It is ours by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you have professed your faith in Christ, you can't undo it. You're not that powerful. So we finish... Jesus, who's heartbroken, turns around and he says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Oh. He asked the 12. So, of course, it's Simon Peter. You know, Simon, bless his heart, I relate to Simon a lot. Boy, he a lot of times speaks before he thinks. You know, he's got his foot halfway down his throat before he finally calms down. I mean, he was the one who tried to save Jesus, you know, there in the garden uh, by pulling out his sword. And, Jesus, and then he got scolded by Jesus in front of everybody. And so, but Simon, well, he was bold. Man, he was bold. And he said, Lord, huh, to whom shall we go? The old song, where could I go? but to the Lord. Look what he says. You have the words. While the rest of the crowd heard hard words, he says, I hear eternal life words. And we've come to, what's the word? Believe. And to know that you are the Holy One of God. Oh, oh man. Living a life wholly devoted to Christ can get pretty lonely, folks. It can. In a world poisoned with political correctness, biblical truth is not only not popular in the mainstream, it's offensive. You go online and post <laughs> hard biblical truth. You see what kind of a snake's den you just poked. Peter said, we've come to believe that you're the Holy One of God. This is huge. In other words, while the others have said, you're a nut. We don't believe any of this. Peter, on the other hand, who's not an idiot, he said, look, I've seen the works. I've listened to you. You are the Holy One. You know who else called Jesus the Holy One of God? Demons. 
In Mark 1, 24, the demon screamed, Jesus, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, atheism is a strange thing. Even the devils never fell into that vice, for the devils tremble and believe. Now in verses 70 and 71, we see that Jesus, Jesus talks about Judas, who was the prototype of the false disciple, and we'll take a closer look at him in chapter 13. But apart from Judas, these disciples were true disciples. What's a true disciple? Well, we could spend a lot of time there, but I'll just quote Jesus in John 10, 27, where he said, My sheep, those truly mine, hear my voice and listen to me. They don't reject my words, they embrace my words. I know them. They generally profess their faith in me and they follow me. I'm not a stumbling block to them. I'm the shepherd and they're my sheep. And they follow me regardless of the cost of doing so. Tradition teaches, folks, that every disciple was martyred for his faith. Today, Middle Eastern Christians are beheaded because of their faith. Again, Bonhoeffer, as he juxtaposed cheap grace with costly grace. He said, costly grace, or true discipleship, is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. I like that. So, and bring it to a close, we've looked at false disciples and true disciples. I ask you and I ask my friends who are watching online, which disciple are you? There's a thing called common grace. Theologians call it common grace. You've heard even ardent atheists talk about how good they can be. Atheists, non-Christians can forgive. They can be kind. They can open the door for people. They can check on widows. They can do all those things. We are capable of this goodness, this common grace, because we're all made in the image of God. That's where common grace comes from. In other words, there's that uh, mantra championed by the uh, neo-atheists. You can be good without God. The problem with that statement is how we define good. Because Within that context, we define good by human terms. It's a moving target. What's good down the street may not be defined as good here. What's evil in one part of the country may not be evil in one part of the country or another part of the world, right? And so those can be moving targets all over the map. So we need a barometer, we need a true north the Bible's our true north. The Bible tells us there's none good, none righteous, not even one. Paul wrote to Timothy that it's possible to have, quote, a form of ungodliness, or a form of godliness, but denying its power. And that's what this is. That's how to be good without God. You have a form, a shadow of godliness, but there's no God in you with a capital G. And so John would even write this. He would say, they, apostates, false teachers, now look what he says. They went out where? From where? From us. Seeming at first to be Christians. But they were not really of us because they were not truly born again. I mentioned my daughters last week. No, I mentioned it Sunday in the late service. Boy, Michelle and I, you know, parenting's hard. They, they, don't, they don't pop out with any instructions, right? Um, and <laughs> when they start dating, <laughs> I have a friend who said, you know, our kids are going to kill us. And there are times I thought, I'm going to die. I, I always thank my girls. You know, you're the reason I'm on blood pressure medicine, right? Um, 
But they, you know, they may have met a guy and they'll say, well, I will go. Is he a believer? That's our first question. Is he a believer? Oh, yes, yes. He loves Jesus. Well, after a little investigation, I realize I don't know what Jesus he's talking about, but it's not the one in the Bible. So you can have this seeming Christianity, right? This form of godliness. You can act the act. We can all pretend until it gets hard. And that's what happened here in the synagogue on the west side of the shore of Galilee when Jesus put it down and they said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. So I want to ask you, I suspect, I would suspect everybody in here is a Christian. That you, At some point in your life, you've placed your faith in Christ. But I want to ask these questions to my friends here, if you're watching. If you were to die in your sleep tonight, do you know, do you know that you'd go to heaven? Well, you may say, yes, I've been a good person. My good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds. So they always ask this follow-up question. So when you stand before Christ, and if he should ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what will your answer be? My good deeds outweighed my bad deeds will not hold up in that court. Any other answer than I have placed my faith in you as my Lord, my Savior, my King. I confess with my mouth that you are God and that God raised you from the dead. Any answer other than that dooms you to a devil's hell, according to the Bible. Apparently, on the day of judgment, there will be many false disciples who will offer answers other than the one I just mentioned. Those who have given lip service to Jesus but refused to believe he was God made flesh and that he had given his life as a sacrifice for our sins so that we might have life in his name. For Jesus gave this haunting warning. He said, on that day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and, and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So I end with this, again from the author of Hebrews. If this is you, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And for you watching online, you know I always tell you this. You email me, you message me, you call me. I live on the corner of 80th and Frankfurt. Come see me. Um, nothing would give me greater pleasure than to talk to you about faith in Jesus Christ. He is our hope, our peace, our truth. He is our true north in a world that seems to be collapsing in on top of us. He says to us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our worry, in the midst of our COVID, I've got this. Trust me. So the author of Hebrews writes, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving. Unbelief is the sole unforgivable sin. Unbelief. So he says, see that none of you has an unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Today, he says it again. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The Lord loves you so much, so much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together and have the honor of opening up your word and studying it. God, it drives deep into our heart. Lord, help us to embrace your words 
all of them. And Father, I pray for those, Lord, who, Lord, if they're not just altogether against you, for those who may just be on the fence, God, help them to know. We, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Help them to know that the Christian faith is an intelligent faith. It's a reasonable faith. It's a logical faith. But it is a faith. But so is atheism. And so, Lord, I ask you for anybody out there, Lord, who needs to talk, Lord, who needs to come to you, I pray, Lord, that you'd call their name and that they would come and once for all enjoy the living water and the bread of life. We pray this in the name of of the Holy One of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for coming.